Welcome to the Humane Animal Welfare Society's presentation on the five freedoms. So today we'll be talking about the five freedoms of animal welfare, and I'll be talking about ways that Haas uses them to care for the animals in our custody. So you might be wondering, what are the five freedoms? The five freedoms of animal welfare are standards of care that were developed to make sure that the animals being cared for by people are getting everything they need to not only be physically healthy, but also taking into consideration their mental well-being. So the first freedom is the freedom from hunger and thirst. So this seems pretty simple, right? We just want to make sure that the animals get food and water and then everything is all good. But we actually put a lot more thought and consideration into this first freedom than you might think. So the first thing I want to talk about is that our animals get 24-hour access to clean water. I want to make an emphasis on the word clean because it's not enough to make sure that the animal's water is clean. We also need to make sure that whatever the water is delivered in is also clean. So let's say our kennel staff come in in the morning and they see that a cat's water dish is still full from the night before. They're actually going to empty that water dish, put it into the sink to be cleaned, and give that cat a new clean water bowl and fill it with fresh water. So even if the water looks clean, the fact that it's been sitting there for 12 hours could mean that there are things in the water that we aren't able to visibly see. Have you ever gone to clean your pet's bowl and felt a little bit of slime on the bottom of the water dish? This slime is called bacterial biofilm and biofilm can contain algae, bacteria, or fungi that comes from stuff that a pet licks or eats. Biofilms can provide a good environment for bad bacteria that can infect our pets and make them very sick. So the next thing on the list is access to food. So of course we want to give our pets food and if you're talking about something like a cat or a dog where the bags of food have the word dog on it and then food, then we know that that's food that is nutritionally created specifically for a dog. So where it comes in a little bit more complicated is when we have more unusual animals come into the shelters. Not only do we take in dogs and cats, but we also take in just about anything else that can be a pet. So here in this picture, we have an iguana who's eating greens, but just because that's a reptile doesn't mean that all reptiles would eat that. Sometimes we get reptiles in that we're not very familiar with, and then we have to start doing some research to ensure that we're feeding them properly. We've also gotten animals that were surrendered to the shelter whose owners didn't feed them the appropriate foods. And then we have to take care of animals who are malnourished or have other health problems because they were fed the wrong food. We wanna make sure that the animals get the appropriate amount of food. So if we feed too little, we have an animal who is malnourished and that is going to eventually not weigh enough. If we feed too much, we're going to have an obese animal. Sometimes we have animals that have health issues and need to go on to special diets. It could be an animal that was brought into the shelter that is underweight and just needs some additional calories to bulk up a little bit. Or maybe it's an animal that comes in that is overweight and needs to go on a diet or even special diet food to help lose weight. But it could also be something like some kidney issues that require that they be on some kind of special prescription type food. And then the other thing we want to think about is how are we setting up that animal's cage to make sure that the food and water access is going to be appropriate. So in this picture we have a pile of kittens. On the right hand side in the back of the cage you can see food and water. On the left hand side in the front of the cage you can see a litter pan. And the reason we set up the cat cages this way is that cats are extremely clean animals. They don't want to eat and drink water from an area that is too close to where they go to the bathroom. So we try to make sure that the food and water is as far away from the litter pan as possible. All right, let's go to the next freedom. Now we have freedom from discomfort. So the first thing I want to talk about is the fact that all of our dogs and cats are given blankets or beds to lay on because who doesn't want a nice comfortable bed? The dogs are given cots. The reason for this is that it will be colder on the floor than it will be if you're suspended a few inches above the floor. And so the cots help keep them warmer, especially in the winter time. 
Rabbits have a solid floor instead of grating. Some rabbit caging is made with slats in them so that if the rabbit goes to the bathroom, that just falls through to a tray that's positioned underneath the cage. Haas doesn't have that. We have cages with solid floors. However, the solid floor of the caging for the rabbits is stainless steel, which is really slippery. Rabbits have fur that grows on the bottom of their paws. So slippery floors and fur means that the rabbit would slip quite a bit when he's hopping around in his cage. So we try to put mats on the floor so that there's a nice stable surface that won't cause them to slip as they're walking around. Our small animals, like our hamsters and our guinea pigs, have bedding to walk on and nest in. We try to make sure the cages are large enough to be comfortable for the animals. Now, unfortunately, because we do have so many animals, we cannot give them a cage that we would necessarily recommend for somebody who has them as a pet because we expect that the animals in the shelter won't be there very long. In the short term, it's fine. However, long term, we would want those animals to have bigger cages, but we give them as much space as we possibly can so that the animals are comfortable while in our care. And then we want to make sure that the animals have an appropriate elimination area. So in, that, in the case of dogs, it would mean that we have enough volunteers taking them outside so that they can go to the bathroom outside. And in other animals like cats and rabbits, we provide a litter box for them. And then the last thing I want to talk about is grooming. So grooming would include things like making sure that the fur is brushed out, trimming toenails, making sure that their teeth are cared for. So in this picture on the right hand side, that dog came into the shelter and had not been brushed or trimmed in a very, very long time. And on the left hand side, you can see all of the hair that was shaved off of that poor dog. So when animal fur gets matted like that, it starts to pull at the skin. It is very uncomfortable for the animal and it can also cause overheating. In this case, we had to shave that dog down. Sometimes we'll have to shave cats down too if they come in with really matted fur. So we try to make sure that the, the nails are trim and they're not too long. Um, nails that are too long can cause the animal to walk in a way that is uncomfortable for them. We'll take a look at the mouth and see what the teeth look like. And in some cases, they might have to go to our vet clinic and get their teeth cleaned. The third freedom is freedom from pain, injury, or disease. So when an animal comes into Haas, the first thing we do is we evaluate them for health. Our staff is going to look for things like external parasites such as fleas, ticks, lice, things like that. They're going to check for internal parasites, so worms living in the intestinal tract or the stomach. They're going to look at the eyes. Are the eyes clear or are they runny? They're going to look in the ears and just want to make sure that the animal is healthy. If they find that there's something that is concerning, then we're going to make sure that they're given whatever medicines they might need to help them or we might have our veterinarians take a look at them if there's something that our kennel staff isn't equipped to handle. We give vaccines to dogs and cats when they first come in, that's what intake is, to prevent illness. So the reason for this is that whenever you've got a large number of animals in one building, the chance that one animal who's sick will spread it to others goes up quite a bit. So we try to make sure that we're preventing illness or at least reducing the amount of illness in the shelter by giving vaccines of some of the more common illnesses that our dogs and cats can possibly catch. We make sure that the caging is clean throughout the day to keep the living space sanitary. If cages are dirty, that's just a great germ factory. That's a way to make sure that animals do get sick. So we try to make sure that it's as clean as we possibly can make it. The fourth freedom is freedom to express normal behavior. So normal behavior will really depend on the type of animal that you're talking about. A bird doesn't behave the way that a rabbit does and a rabbit doesn't behave the same way that maybe a, a dog does. So we need to know what normal behavior is for each species that might be coming into the shelter. One of the things we can do is make sure that the animals are provided with appropriate toys. So here we've got birds that have a variety of toys in their, their cage. So they've got the bells and they've got the, the balls hanging down and things they can peck at. 
and we need to make sure that they have something to do that is going to be enjoyable to them. We want to make sure that the animals get the right kind of caging. For instance, rats really like to have levels. They're very good at climbing. So we wouldn't want to put a rat into an aquarium. We'd want to give them a wire cage that has a couple of different levels and different things for them to climb on. We want to set up the environment in the cage to allow normal behavior. So here we've got a picture of a hamster cage. Hamsters really like to go through tunnels. We've got some cardboard tubes and some PVC tubes that they can climb in. We have the egg carton so they can climb in that egg carton. They can chew on it. There's a variety of different things that they can do. We want to make sure the caging is large enough to allow for normal behavior. So for instance, rabbits like to hop. And so if you have them in too small of a cage, they're not able to do that. So you want to make sure that they have enough space that they can actually walk around. We want to give them an opportunity to exercise. So here in this hamster's cage, you can see he has a running wheel. And we want to make sure that animals that chew are given things to chew on. Rabbits and rodents have teeth that grow continuously, so they need to have things to chew on or their teeth grow too long. So rabbits and rodents are given things like cardboard tubes. That egg carton is a good example of something that they can chew on. The buddy system means that an animal came in with a friend and we want to make sure that those animals stay together if they're emotionally bonded. So in this case, we have two cats that came in together, they're friends. If we separate them, they're going to be stressed because now not only have they lost their home and they're in a strange environment with strange people and strange things going on, but they've lost their friend too. So if we can keep those animals together, it reduces the stress that they're experiencing. The last freedom is freedom from fear and distress. And this can be really challenging in an animal shelter because we're talking about animals that have been taken away from a very familiar environment with people who are familiar to them and placed into a new environment with a different routine and strangers. In addition to that, once they go up for adoption, they have lots and lots of strangers walking past them on a regular basis staring into their cage. So we do the best that we can. One of the things that we can do is with the small animals, we can give them little houses in which they can hide. So if they get a little stressed and overwhelmed by all the traffic, they have a place to go where they can kind of get away from it all. We also try to make sure that we have something like that for cats. So in this picture, we have a box that some of our camp kids created for the cats. And since then, we've actually purchased some really nice plastic houses that the cats can go into and just kind of hide a little bit. So when cats are stressed, they really like to just pretend that nobody's there. So hiding is a good way to provide them with an outlet for that. We have panels on the front of our dog kennels. It can be extremely stressful to a dog to have nonstop traffic of other dogs and people walking past their kennel all day long. And if there's a little bit of a barrier, then they won't see as much of that stimulation and it can be easier for dogs to hide a little bit if they don't have an open face kennel door. If we have really fearful dogs who are very stressed and aren't coping well in the shelter, we will send them to foster homes where they can have a family-like environment and they can reduce the stress greatly because of that. We also want to train those staff and the volunteers how to interact appropriately with, a, with an animal to make sure that they're being handled in such a way that won't increase the amount of stress for that pet. So this seems pretty straightforward, right? Well, I'm going to talk about one of the things that we used to do when we cleaned cat cages. It'll sound like it adheres to all of these freedoms. And then I'll talk a little bit about why that wasn't necessarily the case. So this is the way we used to clean the cages at Haas. We used to remove the cats from the cages every morning. They were placed in temporary cages for cleaning. All the litter boxes, dishes, bedding, and toys were removed and we replaced all of that with clean items. All the cages were power washed with disinfectant and they were dried. We wanted to make sure that all the germs and bacteria were gone before we put the cats in them. And then a lot of times the cats ended up in a different cage than what they had been in before because 
when you've got cats in temporary cages and you take everything off and you clean the cage, you can't remember where the cat was to begin with, so they might have just ended up in a different cage altogether. So the problem is that moving cats in and out of the cage caused stress. So every time our kennel staff took them out of the cage, put them into a, a temporary cage, that cat was a little bit stressed because of that routine. We know that cats don't adapt well to new environments. Um, the new cage in the setup was causing stress. So they went from having everything be familiar for 24 hours, they were just getting used to it, and then somebody came along and took all the familiar items out of their cage and replaced it with new things, and maybe things weren't set up exactly the same way they were when the cat was removed. Cats are very attuned to scent, and they feel a lot more comfortable if they have familiar smells. So once a cat had been laying in a bed and had been putting its scent all over its cage, it was starting to feel a little bit more comfortable. Well, when the cats were, were removed from that cage and the cage was deep cleaned, it took away all the familiar scents. So not only did the cat have a new cage, a new setup, new items, but their familiar scent was gone. And we know that stress weakens the immune system, making it more likely that an animal will become ill. And that's actually what happened in this case. Because of this cleaning protocol, the cats were stressing out, and we were seeing a large amount of cats come down with an upper respiratory infection. So what this meant is that the cats had to be taken off the adoption floor. We couldn't put them up for adoption. And we had to treat them with antibiotics. And once they were well, they could go back up for adoption. We actually changed our, our cleaning protocol. So now, instead of taking the cats completely out of the cage and replacing everything, we do more of a spot cleaning protocol. The new cleaning protocol means that the cats stay in the cage and our kennel staff takes a look at the cage. They replace the food and water so that we don't have fungus or bacteria growing in the food and water. But if the bedding is clean and the toys are clean, everything remains as it is. So that way the cat doesn't have to deal with a change in bedding, a change in toys, and the cage itself still smells like the cat. The interesting thing is that once we went to this new way of cleaning, we saw the number of cats getting sick go way down. So because we had reduced the amount of stress caused by the old cleaning protocol, the cats were not getting sick in as great numbers as they were with the old cleaning protocol. So I want you to take a, a minute and think about what do you need to know before you can provide the five freedoms. So the answer is you need knowledge. You need to know that type of species nutritional requirements. You need to know what behavior they have as far as natural behavior so you can provide for those needs. You need to know what illnesses they can get. You need to know what kind of toys they like to play with. So research before you come up with a plan for the five freedoms is going to be critical because if you make assumptions you might get it wrong and then you're not actually providing the freedoms that that animal needs. So I hope you've enjoyed learning about the five freedoms. If you have a pet at home, or if you're thinking about getting a pet, think of ways that you can use your knowledge of the five freedoms to make life better for your pet. If you go to visit a zoo or an aquarium or an animal shelter, look for ways that those places are using the five freedoms to improve the lives of the animals in their care. Thanks so much for joining me today to learn about the five freedoms. And I hope you enjoyed visiting the Humane Animal Welfare Society virtually.